Hello everyone and thank you for joining me for today's webinar. Today we will be discussing understanding persistence. My name is Erin Letts and I am the Operations Manager here at Blackbard Management Consulting and I will be your host for today. Now before we go on, I do want to just briefly talk about what we're going to discuss today. Um, we're gonna begin with a basic overview of SAP persistence. Then we're going to go on to talk about some components of persistence. And then I'm going to give you a couple of examples to help you maybe understand persistence just a little bit better. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, if you're joining me here today, it is likely because you want to learn a little bit more about SAP Persistence Service. Well, one of the simplest explanations of SAP Persistence is that it basically forms a bridge between your relational database and your ABAP objects. Now, what is unique about the Persistence Service is that it lets ABAP programmers work with relational database data in an object-oriented way. So it's kind of like working with the programming languages Java or uh, C Sharp. Now, <clears throat> if you have any experience with those other programming languages, such as Java or C Sharp, then maybe you have heard about ORM frameworks, otherwise known as Object Relational Mapping Frameworks. These ORM tools enable users to construct classes with attributes, and then, then the framework automatically generates the corresponding database table into the database and then represents the data like objects. SAP Persistent Service is not exactly like ORM, but it's still, it's still a pretty good initiative from the gurus over at SAP. Um, we admit it's not perfect, but SAP is making continuous improvements, and we're actually we're pretty excited to see what's coming up in the future. One improvement that we are certainly hoping for is regarding the fact that um, currently the system does not automatically create new database tables, database views, or structures for the object model in the ABAP dictionary. So you have to do this manually for yourself, and we have to admit that sometimes this can be rather time consuming. So maybe instead of comparing SAP Persistent Service to ORM, let's, um, let's consider it as a layer in application architecture that enables users to work with relational databases as ABAP objects. Now, a little bit later on in this webinar, I'm going to introduce you to the SAP Persistent Service using a database table and we'll create a persistent class and I will show you its use through some simple examples to ensure that you thoroughly understand. All right, so let's begin by talking about transient data and then we'll talk about how persistent data is a little bit different. So to begin, it's important to note that the nature and longevity of the data in ABAP programs gives that data a unique name. In, in principle, ABAP programs work with local program data, which resides in the program's internal session. Now, this data is known as transient data, and it lives only as long as its context, that is, as long as its associated procedure for local procedure data its object for attributes of classes or its program for global program data. Now in transient data, once the data is out of the context or runtime of the program, the value no longer exists. So a good example of transient data is, um, say you're saving a Word document and you click save. The document will be persisted to a folder on your hard drive. But on the other hand, if you click don't save or cancel, the transient data is gone, but you can still currently edit the file. Now, if the data can be preserved beyond the context or runtime of the program, it is then called persistent data. In SAP systems, persistent data usually occurs as the content of database tables, but it can also occur as the contents of files on application and presentation servers, such as a hard drive or flash memory. 
Um, an example of this <clears throat> can also be taken from the previous slide. You can store the data file on your hard drive or in a database so the transient data will be persisted. But if the transient data is not saved, it will be deleted. In order to work with persistent data, the system must load the persistent data into transient data objects. Those objects belong to the ABAP program while that program is being executed. Once processed, it stores the data in a persistent form again. Um, but during this time, the content of the data actually exists twice, once transiently in the ABAP program and once persistently in the appropriate storage medium. Um, a typical example would be reading data from a database table using the select statement in a transient work area, modifying the work area, and then updating the database table using update. Now, in such cases, the contents of transient and persistent data are different in the interim during this process. Okay, so now let's touch on data and object-oriented programming. In an ideal object-oriented application, data occurs only as the attributes of objects. So that is, if we ignore the local data in methods. Objects are a collection of functions and data, so the description of an object or the class occurs persistently as a piece of source code, but its attributes exist only as long as the object. Now, however, an object in ABAP objects is transient in principle. It exists in the internal program session only from the time it is generated until it is deleted by the garbage collector. Um, the purpose of garbage collection is to identify and then discard objects that are no longer needed by a program so that their resources may be reclaimed and reused. Therefore, to work with persistent data in objects, you must perform access and program access to where those objects are stored within the methods of the class. However, in completely object-oriented business application programming, it is kind of pointless to simply transfer the classical separation of data and functions to the methods, that is, to work with objects using procedural programming within the objects themselves. Ideally, you could save the encapsulation of data and functions persistently within the object instead, um, a program could then leave an object in a certain state, and a second program could continue working on the object in that state. Classes of objects are already persistent anyways, but you need some way of saving the attributes of an object persistently and then make reference to the appropriate class. Um, the persistent service actually allows you to do exactly that. Um, an example of this would be a saved original file on a hard drive versus an unopened and unsaved document with changes. So technically speaking, ABAP objects are always transient, just like the data objects in ABAP programs. There are no persistent objects in ABAP objects. However, the persistent service within object services allows application developers to work with persistent objects. The Persistence Object Services, which is otherwise known as POS, can be considered as a logical software layer between the ABAP program and the database. A POS allows you to save the attributes of objects with a unique identity and then reload them when they are again required. So simply put, the persistent service ensures that an object is initialized in a specific state and then saves the state of that object when needed. Um, the relationship between the object and the description of its state in the database is similar to the relationship between transient and persistent data. The states of the object when it is instantiated reflects the state of the data in the database at that time. Uh, changes to the object states in the ABAP program are not written to the database immediately, but only after the appropriate request has been made, that is, the user has executed the commit work statement. <clears throat> 
So basically, a persistent object exists as an original in the database and as a copy in one or more ABAP programs. If several programs use the persistent service to instantiate objects of the same class before one of these programs has changed the state using the commit work command, then the objects will all have the same initial state. Um, just please note at present, a persist the persistent service lock concept has not been implemented yet, which would ensure that there is only one transient mapping for each persistent object. So ultimately, ABAP programmers are not really, really working with persistent objects as such, but rather the persistent service makes it appear as if they are. <clears throat> Now, to use the persistent service for objects, the classes of these objects must be created as persistent classes in the class builder. So just to clarify, the term persistent class does not imply that a class is persistent. Rather, it means that the objects of that class, as well as their state, are managed by the persistent service. So for example, the objects of these classes are instantiated in the ABAP program with a method of the persistent service, which then ensures that the initialization is correct and is not being done with the usual create object statements. When the class builder creates a persistent class, it automatically generates an associated class known as the class actor or class agent whose methods manage the objects of persistent classes. As well as their identity, persistent classes can contain key attributes which allow the persistent service to ensure that the content of each persistent object is unique. So now let's discuss managed objects. The objects of persistent classes are also managed by the persistent service. This means, among other things, that these objects are instantiated with a method of the class actor again and not with the create object statement. Um, these objects are known as manage objects. Uh, please note that objects managed by the persistent service can either be persistent or transient. Also, persistent objects must be managed by the persistent service and the service connects the object with the database. A transient objects of persistent classes are also managed by the persistent service. So for example, the persistent service ensures that the object is unique within a program and fulfills this by verifying all of its key attributes. Okay, so now let's take a look at some of the key components of the persistent service. The SAP Persistent Service consists of global classes and interfaces. The upper four interfaces that you see here, outlined in red, are shared between all persistent classes. The lower three classes, outlined in red again, are specific and automatically generated for each persistent class that is created. The ZCL MyFlight, outlined there in the bottom right-hand corner, is the persistent class that we are going to create in just a few moments. It has to implement the IFOS state interface, which ensures that all persistent objects can be accessed in the same way. Now, as you can also see here, this class has numerous attributes and get set methods as many fields exist in its connected persistent structure that was generated within the class builder. For each persistent class, two agent classes are generated by the class builder, an abstract and a final. Now, as you can see here, the ZCA MyFlight on the bottom left is one of our agent classes, and its responsibility is to manage the ZCL MyFlight persistent objects on the bottom right. Um, actually, all the SQL statements take place in this ZCA agent class. So it serves as a kind of um, data repository. ZCB MyFlight, located right there above ZCA MyFlight, is the superclass of ZCA MyFlight and is also generated by the class builder. It implements the following interfaces seen up at top, IF, 
IFOS factory, IFOSCA persistency, and IFOSCA instance. Okay, so now that we are a little bit more familiar with the concepts and components of persistence, let's take an actual look at a few examples. Let's begin by using the transaction SE24 to start the class builder. There, you want to create a new class with the name ZCL MyFlight. And as you can see, we have done that here in the screenshot of the pop-up all the way to the left. Um, it is going to be the persistent class of the database table called SFlight. So after filling in all the required fields, such as class name and description, ensure to then select the class type persistent class and then click save and select the package where you want to store the new class. In our example here, we are creating our classes in the temporary directory TMP. Now, once that is done, click save again. So now, if you start transaction SE80 and navigate to your local temporary directory, you will see the list of the newly created classes ZCA, ZCB, and ZCL. After saving the new class, you can now verify exactly what persistent class means. And as you can see here, under the interfaces tab, it implements the interface of IFOS state, like I showed you a few moments ago in the diagram we reviewed. It is also friend of our abstract agent class, ZCB My Flights, as you can verify here under the friends tab. Okay, so now that we've done that, and we are familiar with the basics of our persistent class, let's go ahead and connect it to an ABAP dictionary object. So begin this by setting its persistence mapping, and you want to do this by pushing the persistence button there highlighted in yellow and red. After clicking on the persistence button, the pop-up featured here will appear. Now we want to assign a table view or structure to our class. So choose the database table that consists of flights called S flights. You can do this by simply entering the name of the data dictionary you want to map. And again, in this table, it is S flight. Once you've selected S flight, click the continue icon to confirm. After assigning the table class builder, loads its metadata into the lower tables and fields section. Simply double click on any one of the fields in order to load that field into the maintain area. Using the maintain area, you can now modify the ID, description, and visibility of a field individually. After completing the maintenance of the given field, simply click enter in order to assign it to the persistent class as an attribute. Now, after pressing enter, the given field appears under the class as an attribute and loads the next field into the maintain area where you will then perform the same workflow. So again, let's just repeat that real quick. You wanna select each column and field you want to add to your class in the lower area of the screen, double click on the name, then it appears in the middle maintain area section of the screen. You then click the black little arrow icon to add it to the class, then it appears in the upper area. Repeat this process for each field from the table. Here again, it is S flight, and you would do this for every one that you wish to add. In our example, we want to add all columns from table S flight into our class. Um, in the next slide, you'll see that once we do this, the lower area is empty and all columns are listed in the upper area. Uh, please note that if all fields from a table are not required, there's no worries. The unused columns can remain in the lower section and these fields can be added later um, if and when they are required. Now, after applying the same workflow for each field, the attributes under our class appear, as you can see here in the red highlighted screenshots. Now, after saving the persistence mapping, you want to return to the class definition using SE80 or transaction SE24 in order to verify the components of the class. Now, navigate to the directory 
where you have created the classes to view the structure and components. Verify the generated attributes based on the mapping you have now selected. So along with the new attributes, um, various get and set methods are also generated. Uh, please note that besides the persistent class, the class builder activates the actor classes and all generated objects as well. Um, this will run automatically once you save your work. And once you save your work, that's it. Now you have a persistent class called ZCL My Flight that you can use in the system. So for the sake of simplicity, I'll now show you the basic use of persistent objects in some easy to understand examples. Um, I'm gonna show you two different operations, displaying and creating. So let's first check the display operation via the sample screenshot here. Um, in the core of the try catch block, as you can see right there in line nine, you can see that we ask a reference of our agent class and save it in the reference variable low flight agent by querying the class attribute of the ZCA my flight called agent. Then we simply ask the agent to retrieve a persistent entry from the database with the BA business key. Um, that can be seen here in lines 12 through 14. The get persistent call requires all primary keys from the database in order to identify a unique entry. And here you can see carrier ID, connection ID, and flight date. Um, save the receiving reference of the flight object, I'm sorry, the flight instance in the reference variable in the local object called low flight. And you can see that has been done here in line 12. So from now on, you have an initialized instance of the ZCL my flight, and you can call its get set methods such as um, get price. Um, that can be seen here in line 17. So this process is very effective and reusable among various clients such as ABAP programs, ABAP classes, function modules, and so on. Um, here, as you can see, you can verify the results. So the next example I want to share is to create a flight object using the persistent class by referencing the agent class in the same way as we just did previously and saving it in the variable low flight agent. Um, you want to ask the agent to create a persistent in the database with key export parameters. And these are the primary keys of the database table S flight. So that would be uh, for key field carrier ID, as you can see in line 11, for key field connection ID in line 12, and for key field flight date in line 13. And then you can even set a new price, as you can see there in line 16. Now, at last, there is nothing left to do but commit the work using the commit statement and then save it. And now you simply run the report and a new record appears in the table. And here you can again check the results of the code. You can see our new entry in the first line and you can see the price we set in our sample program that came from the previous slide on line 16. Okay, well, so that wraps us up for today. Um, I just really wanna pause for one moment to summarize for just one moment. Um, so using persistent classes, um, you can take further steps toward more transparent and well-separated classes based on responsibilities uh, such as data layer, data access layer, business layer, application layer, and UI layer. Um, another benefit of implementing these classes that we talked about is that they are reusable. So you only have to implement them once and then you can reuse them as many times as you want. And finally, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, ABAP persistence is not perfect. Um, you know, it's still in the works, but it is a pretty good initiative so far from SAP. And we are super excited to see what's coming in the future. All right, so that wraps us up. Um, if any of you have any additional questions, please feel free to send us an email to info at blackvard.com and we will get to you as soon as possible. So thank you guys for joining us today and we'll see you again soon. Bye guys.